There are many games from my childhood that I remember fondly. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, Tide the Tasmanian Tiger, Lord of the Rings The Two Towers, James Bond Agent Under Fire, Red Dead Revolver, and Zoo Tycoon are all games that I think still hold up today. However, there are other games that I remember fondly that upon playing I found out were not so good. Brute Force, Star Wars The Phantom Menace, Zapper, and Enter the Matrix were all games that, upon playing as an adult, the magic was gone. As a kid, every video game seemed to transport me. Before I experienced so many good games, I only had a handful to play. I played these over and over, learning every last inch of them. Nostalgia can repaint the things from our past as being better than they were. We paint over the imperfections and mistakes of something that can be horrendous and fondness because of our desire to return to a specific time and place. Many of us wish we could become kids again. Many of the things we did as kids were set as foundational touchstones in our mind. As adults, we try to reconnect to those times. It can be deadly to luxuriate in the excess of previously lived experiences, but it can also be helpful to look back on what made us who we are. For many of us, video games were where we spent hours of our time as children. I don't know what my first video game was. I can confidently say it was either one of three games. The first game is The Adventures of Cookies and Cream. It's a cooperative puzzle game developed by FromSoft. It would be interesting if this were my first game because my favorite kinds of games today are the Souls-like games, which started with FromSoft's Demon Souls. Carnivores 2 is another game that might have been my first game. This is a hunting game in which you hunt dinosaurs. Growing up, video games scared me. Video games require the player to engage to progress. Carnivores 2 scared the crap out of me as a kid. When I stalked the lonely swamps of Dilaphaeus Hills, I experienced some of my first brushes with terror. In carnivores, you select which dinosaurs you want to hunt, but that doesn't mean they will be the only dinosaurs on the map. Sometimes, a miscreant Velociraptor, Allosaurus, or Spinosaurus would sneak up and cause a miniature heart attack. Years later, I was surprised to find this relatively unknown game, at least to me, was persisting with a robust modding community. It is available to play on phones and even has a recent game in the series, though the developers abandon it in a pretty lackluster state. The final game that might have been my first game is Saints of Virtue. Of all the early games I played, this one was the most influential. Much like Carnivores, this game scared me. It's a strange game. Though many of the mechanics are what you would see in other first-person shooters of the time, the design was just a bit peculiar. I did get jump scared by the enemies in the game, but there's also an eeriness to some of the locations. I think if you were to take the game and modify a few things, it wouldn't be hard to make it into a horror game. There isn't much easily accessible information out there about this game. On YouTube, only one other person than me has a full playthrough, at least that I can find. There's a fan patch that had an update as recently as 2022 called Saints X, developed by Idler and Isaiah Kelly that fixes a lot of the annoyances and game-breaking bugs that make the game a struggle to play. Other than that, most of what you will find is people bashing the game for its Christian message. The game is mostly forgotten and didn't make much of an impact outside of the relatively niche Christian game scene. I haven't forgotten it though. When I discovered Vaporwave in the liminal space and backroom communities a few years ago, it made me think of Saints of Virtue again, and it led me down the long rabbit trail of doing my walkthrough and exploring the history of the game. I was surprised to see the game hadn't been discovered, because it does really have some trippy visuals and rival what you would see in LSD Dream Simulator. After I finished my walkthrough, I still felt like I had more to do for the game that made such an impact on me as a kid. I love video essays, so I decided to do as comprehensive of an analysis as I could. I have several goals with this video. One to take you from start to finish of the game and analyze the effectiveness of the Christian themes, imagery, and messages. People who have only learned about Christianity from the media do not have an accurate view or the context of years of biblical study. Though I am by no means an authority on Christianity, I have been actively writing about it, studying the word intentionally, and actively pursuing Christ for about seven years. I grew up in a Christian family and attended a Christian school all the way through high school, but I lived a very passive faith. It was only when I read The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I realized that my faith was not a saving one and that my heart had not been changed. Only then did I realize that a Christian walk is active. True faith breeds the desire to help others and love everyone with everything because Christ loves us. 2. To provide an analysis of the game design to see if the game is as bad as the perception seems to be. I feel that if this were released today, 
it would have a better reception with the rise of indie games and novel game designs. Back when this was released, what a game could and couldn't be seemed more rigid and hardware and development resources were a limiting factor. 3. To share how I connect with the game and find it meaningful. Before I get to that, let's go over just what this game is. Saints of Virtue is a game developed by Shine Studios and published by Cactus Game Design. Released in 1999, it shares many of the characteristics of the first first-person shooters like Doom and Quake. It seemed to have a small following at launch, but there has been no cult revival for this game, or any legacy to speak of. There have been no official remasters or re-releases that modernized the game to play on new hardware. I've tried for many years to get this game to work on different computers, and it simply would not. Saints of Virtue traditionally would only run on the original hardware, at least for me, until now. There are two ways that I know of to play Saints of Virtues on a modern day system. One method is to run it through DOS using a custom written batch file. I have no idea who made this file, but I found a random YouTube video describing how to install it and it worked, so I made a video on how to do it in a more easily discernible format if you want to check that out. However, there is an easier way to get this game to run, Saints X. You need to already own a copy of Saints of Virtue. Unless you already have a copy, it's hard to get this game though. The only copies I can find at this time are over $100, so you may have to go another route. The Internet Archives is a download. It is technically piracy, however, I would argue that since the developers are not currently selling copies of the game physically or digitally, or offering a way to compensate them, it's ethical to download it. You do you, though. Once you finally get the game running, you may encounter a number of issues in preventing you from completing the game. That's where I found myself as a kid. Talk about horror. I purchased a game I couldn't beat because the damage the player takes is tied to the game's frame rate. If you don't have a computer that is completely butts, you are going to have to cheat to beat the game. And that's how I beat the game originally. I beat it through a glitch where the player just floats and passes through walls, so I just walk through the door that stands as the last obstacle between you and victory. Walking through walls just like Jesus after he rose from the grave. Hey, if this game really is a Christian game. I'm not here to condemn the game though, quite the opposite. Does it have glitches? Sure. Is it the best designed game in the world? No. Is it creepy and a bit like a psychedelic trip? Yes, but that's sort of why I love it. The media that millennials grew up with was kind of creepy in general. The horror boom of the 80s, the rise of metal and other extreme forms of music, and the weird design aesthetics of the 90s made a lot of millennial television shows look like a liminal horror drug trip. If you've ever seen Rugrats, Cat Dog, SpongeBob, Ren and Stimpy, or Rocco's Modern Life, not to mention Courage the Cowardly Dog, you get a lot of horror imagery and creepy stuff that just isn't in children's content today, at least to my knowledge. The game was unquestionably designed with Christian ideals in mind, however I don't think the developer wanted anyone to take the game too seriously. In the FAQ on their website, they said the game is more entertainment oriented than educational. You will learn verses from the Bible and have to think about how to best use them to overcome the worldly wisdoms. This game isn't meant to teach you the fundamentals of Christianity, but more to comment, possibly causing you to evaluate yourself and continue. It's not where you should start your child on a track of theological education, however it might be a way for a young person to engage with the material on a level that has some meaning to them. I know I certainly enjoyed the biblical elements as a child. I'm also not here to proselytize. I hope to have broken things down to a level where anyone can understand and appreciate what this game has to offer. I don't think you need to be a Christian to get something out of Saints of Virtue or this video. Much like I have an interest in Buddhism and Hinduism, you don't need to be a follower of a particular religion to appreciate the cultural aspects of them. Religion has fundamentally shaped the human world since recorded history. Not at least learning about religion is to deny one of the most important aspects of human culture. Wondering how we got here is one of the things that makes us human. I doubt anyone who has lived long enough to start asking questions about the world hasn't asked, how did I get here? I don't think Saints of Virtue has some deep, life-altering message that people have been missing. I just wanted to honor the game and see what kind of depth I can draw from it, even though it might not be expressly stated within the game itself. Let's begin, shall we? Here we are, the amphitheater of apathy. Already we're in the realm of the strange, a stage with three screens of static behind it surrounded by steps leading to five different hallways. I'm not joking when I say I've had a reoccurring nightmare that takes place in this amphitheater. Saints of Virtue uses symbolism almost exclusively to convey its themes. The static on the screen as a representation of apathy is I guess a passing representation. 
It does feel like you just put a static veil up to the world when you are apathetic. Three of the hallways leading out of the amphitheater go to locked doors or a cavern that we can't cross yet, so the first choice is either the Caves of Loneliness or the Mall of Distractions. These are the two zones you will see more than any other because most people I've seen playing this game quit after the Mall. It seems like 99% of the people go to the Mall of Distractions first, however, I always do the Caves of Loneliness. It's my least favorite zone next to the Pits of Despair. Plus it is self-contained and you don't need to backtrack. One landmark here is the Dark Heartbeat Room. You follow these pillars of light to find a scroll in the darkness. Surprise, two vanity heads are floating in here. Vanity is an Easter Island head looking bro with a heart on the back of its head. I'm not sure how far the developers thought about the implications of the placement of their enemies in the world. I would like to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that vanity is in the caves of loneliness because a life lived in pursuit of vanity or the artificial outer appearance of oneself ultimately leads to a lifestyle of self-pursuit and self-aggrandization. As we age, we become older and our vanity leads to loneliness as our lack of self-development has led to us being shallow and thoroughly detestable human beings, left to scream in the darkness, only guided by pillars of light. Through the scroll we find in the dark, though, we shall find salvation. Though there is darkness in the heart, the light leads us to wisdom. Though there is vanity, we can vanquish it. I think it would be interesting if the scroll you find in the dark here was Matthew 5, 14 through 16, which says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This verse talks about how a Christian is supposed to be a source of good that stands out. Light illuminates so that we can see how things truly are. A lighthouse guides lost ships or ships who can't see to safe harbor. Once you've collected the scroll and the rocks, you can proceed back to the big room into a long corridor with our first glimpse of what looks to be outside. This is like a blue version of the red world from Phantasm, but instead of the tall man, you get, surprise, more vanity. Proceeding onward, you come to a diverging path. One path leads you to the end goal, and one path leads you to a room that still seems weird to me. And it would just see a giant clock ticker swinging. Why is it swinging? I guess it is the ever-present reminder that we were always alone, except for these freaking handsome Squidward boys. We go through a maze of tunnels, find another hidden room, and come to a round chasm with a door in the middle that we can't get to. As you fall into the pit, you will hear the greatest sound that has ever been uttered in video game history. <coughs> with your new text ringtone in hand, you find yourself in a liminal dream, the infinite place of loneliness. I have no idea how this makes sense as a place you would have fallen to. I'm not sure what it's supposed to be. Kind of reminds me of the roof of a car garage, but there are no ramps or cars or anything here. Except for some power-ups that are shaped like an arrow, pointing you to the exit hole. Down I go, and now there's a bridge before me. This door is a scroll door. The objective is to combat worldly wisdom with biblical wisdom. I'm going to analyze each of these scroll doors and see how well or convincing biblical wisdom counters the worldly wisdom. You should have two scrolls by now if you went on the same path as I did. When you use the door, a lowly voice gives you the worldly wisdom, I can do it my way. The correct response to this is John 15, 5, which says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Does this response fit Christianity thematically? I think so. One of the major themes of the Bible is man's constant inability to remain on the path of God's will. The story of Moses, Aaron, and Joshua in the Old Testament tells the story of the constant rebellion of the Israelites against God. Moses freed the Israelites from captivity in Egypt. God told them that he had a promised land waiting for them across the desert. When they came to the promised land, they complained about how scary the inhabitants were. At this point, the Israelites had done nothing but whine the whole time and God punished them for their disobedience. The desert would have taken a few months to cross at most, yet the Israelites took 40 years to cross it. They had to wait for the old generation to die before they were allowed into the promised land. Even Moses never got to see the promised land because of his disobedience when God told him to touch a rock to get water. Instead of touching it, Moses bashed that sucker. God still gave the Israelites water, but the disobedience displayed would have lasting repercussions. 
Likewise, the reason for the latter chunk of the books in the Old Testament, pretty much Isaiah through Malachi, save for Daniel, are the books of the major and minor prophets. The terms major and minor only indicate the length of the book rather than the importance of the prophet. The basic formula for these books is Israel rebels and God sends a prophet to warn them that if they don't abandon their disobedient ways, they're going to get dunked on. Israel listens for some time and then slides back into their old ways. Now that we've pushed the button, we're ready for the mall of distractions. This is a pretty cool zone. You walk in and are greeted by the music you hear as you die. I hope that you like this music because it's going to be playing on repeat for quite some time. As you prance about the mall, you find a new foe, worldliness. I think this is one of the best enemy designs in the game. Kind of reminds me of Snoop Dogg with a globe for hair. No? Anyone? Eh, anyway, I started blasting these fools in the mall, and of course, I wanted to take some of these fine prizes with me. So, oh, it turned to dust. What is the lesson here, kids? All the things we accumulate in life turn to dust. Eventually, everything and everyone you have ever known will eventually stoop down, stop moving, and turn into nutrients for the soil. If all I value is the accumulation of wealth and status symbols like expensive cars or cutting-edge technology, I would not have a fulfilling life, at least according to what my core being tells me. I am thankful for what I have, but if it were all stripped away and my core is still miserable, do I truly have character? It's a different philosophy of living, and one that isn't popular because we live in a consumer culture, but it does seem that wisdom comes irrespective of physical possessions, and the smartest and kindest people in the world are often not the ones who cultivate a vast physical wealth and fortune. As we rely more on possessions and wealth, we have less governing external pressure. While this might sound nice, if we don't have people and systems to keep us in check, we tend to do what we want because there are no consequences of having everything taken away. We begin to function as we think fit. While we may start with good intentions, as we can see from the plethora of celebrities, politicians, and other people of note who act like garbage to others, we can quickly become corrupted by the materials that we thought set us free. Does Saints of Virtue give this depth of commentary on the topic of worldliness? No, items just turn to dust when you try and grab them, and you get one of a few different phrases that implicate the folly of striving for the physical. But I view this game almost as a way of you using your own intelligence to infer the meaning of the game's symbolism. The meaning is not esoterically veiled. It's important, though, not to excuse a lack of design for the intent of inferred depth through an individual's interpretation. The mall is honestly really devoid of content, though for how small it is, it seems easy to get lost. I'll crack that up to there not being any real distinguishing features to serve as landmarks other than the food court? There is a locked door on the upper level, which you can't open yet. You can also find a key chilling in an alcove that unlocks a door on the lower level of the mall. There is a scroll door, but we won't have the scroll for this door until we finish the last area. As we continue to the lower level through the strange food court with no food, we can unlock the door and pick up a needed scroll for the next area. That's all we can do in the mall for now. Next, we're going to head into the pits of despair. What is there to say about despair? This zone has many unique sections, though the monotone color palette and unsettling sounds made me hate this area as a kid. It scared me to go through here. It's a strong contrast between the following two zones and the Mall of Distractions. To access the area, you throw one of the rocks from the Caves of Loneliness to across a chasm. I recommend saving before attempting this. As a kid, I remember a couple of times when I got here and just yeeted the rock into the pit. I guess that's why they gave you two rocks. You get jump scared by Vanity again. Vanity appearing in a place of despair is, again, no coincidence, I believe. Vanity leads to despair. It reminds me of the beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes from the Bible. Chapter 1, starting at verse 2, reads, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, Around and round goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, where they flow again. All things are full of weariness, a man cannot utter it. it the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It has already been in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. 
These verses specifically use the word vanity to highlight the feeling of despair or pointlessness that the author feels toward the world. Traditionally, this text is attributed to King Solomon, one of the three great kings of Israel. After Solomon's death, Israel split and became Israel and Judah. They were conquered by the Assyrians and Babylonians respectively before Persia defeated the Assyrians, freed the Jewish people, and they got to return home to rebuild the temple. As to the veracity of the author of the text, many books of the Bible have unknown authors. Many early writers would adopt the name of a respected figure from their culture to give their writing ethos. Authorship debate is a subject that never really leads to a definitive answer, and I'm not going to try to tackle it here. Regardless of the author, vanity was the word chosen to describe their feeling toward the world. For us, however, vanity can have a double meaning. For us, vanity means pride. However, in the Hebrew in which Ecclesiastes was originally written, vanity means something more akin to the word vapor. How does this change the meaning of the verses? Instead of everything being prideful, it just means everything is transient. Vapor is there, and then it's gone. Nothing is remembered because just as quickly as it came, it dissolves. When Saints of Virtue uses vanity, I believe that the developers intended it to mean pride, since that is the meaning most associated with the word in English. It is because of pride that we despair. Despair is everywhere in the pits of despair. The pits themselves are emblematic of how when we are depressed or feel despair, it can feel like a cavern or hole has opened in our soul. As we continue further into the level, we come across dead ends. Despair can feel like the end. There's nowhere else to go but down. One room that creeped me out in the pits is a ledge with a sign that tells you to jump. I don't know if this was intended, but seeing as we were talking about despair, I can't help but think this is a reference to suicide. Emanating out of the darkness, you can hear a sound. I think it's supposed to be the sound of someone screaming as they are falling. As we established, the game doesn't have a very good grasp on what it sounds like when someone screams. As a child, for some reason, I thought the sound was an elephant. If you do decide to jump, many places just lead to damage. However, on the leftmost platform, if you look down, you'll notice a secret path below. When you drop down, it leads to a narrow walkway, which leads to a claustrophobic tunnel that contains a scroll. Further places of note include rooms and different textures on the wall and geometry coming out of the ground. You can find a prayer altar. At prayer altars, you can pray for health, guidance, to thank God, or just pray. Guidance will give you hints as to where a few key items are located. However, I seldom found this advice useful as it really isn't specific. One of the side paths takes you to a key you need to unlock the upper room in the Mall of Distractions. Finally, we can unlock the scroll door. We should have three scrolls at this point, and I should point out that you will not use all the scrolls that you pick up. If you choose the wrong scroll, you will get a failure noise and get transported somewhere within that particular zone. The door says, we are nothing more than a highly evolved animal. The correct response is Genesis 2-7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. While another Christian might find this a solid argument, depending on how literal they believe the creation account in Genesis to be, I don't think this would convince many people outside of the faith. The problem here comes down to the fundamental mechanism by which Christians believe in God, faith. In the modern day US, many people want evidence of something's existence to believe in it. That's how science works. You have to be able to observe something to say it is real. The problem there, when it comes to Christianity, the proof of God is often subjective and can't be measured tangibly. We can see things we attribute to God, but someone who doesn't believe in God can probably find a reason why it happened. I had faith in God first, and my faith was cemented as belief when I experienced the presence of God saw him move through other people, witnessed miraculous healing, and saw him do things in my life that were too coincidental and in direct response to my prayers that I cannot deny in his existence. The problem though is that there is no physical evidence or no evidence that can be directly recorded as having caused my experiences. Probability, chance, and anomalous things happen all the time and can provide explanations for pretty much anything if you try hard enough. How I would distinguish mere coincidence from God moving involves several components. For one, is the experience miraculous. A miracle is by definition something from the divine. It does not occur naturally. Secondly, does the experience seem in character with God? An occurrence cannot be from God if it violates his character. Finally, is there any external factor that readily explains why something happened? Regardless of whether you believe in God or not, this is a world of systems. There are ways certain things act regularly. Plants perform photosynthesis unless there's some extra plant that is like, mm -mm, I'm a special boy. Some people cannot be convinced by anecdotal evidence. They need data, something concrete. 
So, for a Christian, the scroll's message might be convincing, but to someone who doesn't believe in God, it most likely will not. After pressing the button, we can return to the amphitheater. Upon entering it, our character noticed something is different. If you're paying attention, you'll notice the stage is raised slightly. So that's our goal. Unlock the door in each section. We can return to the mall and grab the mirror. Facing the stage, head to the furthest left door. There is a wall of lasers blocking the path. Use the mirror on the lasers to disable them and enter the gallery of nothingness. The gallery is one of the more visually interesting areas in the first level, and the game in general. There are sculptures and paintings in each wing, many of which don't seem to have any definite shape. One room has hamburgers and soup cans on display. This is an obvious jab at Andy Warhol, who helped popularize pop art. We have rooms of spinning geometrical shapes. We have Jackson Pollock's paintings of splatter art from the abstract expressionist movement. In another room, there's a giant statue of worldliness. Nearly enough, much of the art here seems to follow you no matter what perspective with which you look. This is probably just a happy accident, as there's sprites and thus a 2D image projected in a 3D environment. The effect is that it doesn't have a back or sides. The front is always on display. Worldliness is the enemy here, and it is an apt enemy. Art reflects who we are, and it is how we make our bid at immortality. Leonardo da Vinci died hundreds of years ago, yet we still remember his name and look at his art. The gallery is where I think the message of the game gets a little confused. What I interpret the game to be doing is critiquing modern art for having no meaning. However, I disagree with this message. Just because one person does not see a message or value on a particular piece of art does not mean none exists. What abstract and modern art brings to the table that more realistic art does not is the ability to visualize things that simply do not exist in nature. While I like both realistic and abstract visual art, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I don't think I appreciate it as much as someone more well-versed in it. The art forms I find most compelling are writing, poetry, and film. Perhaps the next era will be more in my area of expertise. Where I find difficulty in interpreting what the game is trying to say about art is the lack of substance in the critique. When you shoot or interact with the art, your character always talks about how moving the piece is or makes a sarcastic comment. All the game seems to be saying is modern art is meaningless and therefore bad. What the game fails to consider though is that the game itself is a piece of modern art. The locations we visit only sometimes even come close to resembling a place in real life. The symbolism that makes up the majority of the game's narrative is often obscure, subtle, or not even present enough that a clear meaning of what it is supposed to mean is often tenuous. Another interpretation one could have about the game's critique of modern art is that humans try to make their own gods through their art. I do think some people try to create a legacy through their art, but I also believe that the compulsion to create is something ingrained in us by God. God created the world in one way or another. We are made in the image of God, so it is no surprise that we also want to create. Unfortunately, we often create art that glorifies ourselves or something else rather than Christ. I don't necessarily think all art needs to glorify God, but I do think it is one of the best tools for worship we have been given. Many people with incredible talent wasted on art that is ultimately pointless. Other than looking at the art, the goal of this area remains just like the other areas. You open the scroll door, pick up some more scrolls, grab a key, and leave. There are quite a few hidden areas here. One hidden area contains a valuable power-up that increases the fire rate of your sword. When you take the right wing of the gallery, you come to a giant statue of worldliness that stares at you all around the room. You can go to an upper level and proceed through rooms with busts of famous people from history, philosophy, and art. After heading up a flight of stairs, we come to our next scroll door. The door says, God is dead. When the hell I see somebody's been reading Nietzsche. God is dead is part of a statement made by Friedrich Nietzsche, an important philosopher in existentialism and nihilism. These are philosophies that question the nature of existence, including the existence of God, meaninglessness, absurdity, and the human condition in the face of extinction and death. The full quote Nietzsche made is, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement? What sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatest of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? So that's what the Gallery of Nothingness is about. In addition to art, it is also critiquing certain philosophies. To get past this door, read Romans 1.20, which says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, 
have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. This Bible quote is often quoted out of context to answer a common question posed to Christianity from both within and by external critics. The question in question is, what happens to people who have never had a chance to hear about God? Often this question is referencing uncontacted tribes in the Amazon or certain tribes on remote islands like Papua New Guinea where people may have never had the possibility of hearing about God. The previously mentioned verse is often a response, putting the onus of responsibility upon each individual. I believe it is up to the individual to find God. To question our existence is an innate human trait, so I believe that whatever circumstance a person is in, they will have a point in their life where they ask, why am I here? Does this always happen? I don't know. It isn't something I can do anything about, so I choose not to let it become a point of conflict for me. However, Romans 1.20, I believe, is quoted out of context. The book of Romans is traditionally attributed to Paul the Apostle. Paul was originally named Saul. He killed Christians until God had a one-on-one -on -one conversation on the road to Damascus with him that left him blind and humbled. After that, he helped establish churches and wrote to them to guide them based on problems within their church. A large chunk of the New Testament is attributed to him. In Romans, Paul is writing to, you guessed it, a church in Rome. Romans 1, 18-23, rather than just verse 20, says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, in birds and animals and reptiles. Rather than talk about people who have never had the chance to know God, verse 20 addresses people who have had the chance to know God and choose their own gods instead. Further verses tell that God gives them over to their desires and they become impure. In the context of saints of virtue, I think this verse is a good response. The gallery of nothingness is about humanity's desire to seek its own God through our hands. Whether built as a physical depiction or philosophy, humans construct our own interpretations of reality. After pressing the button and seeing what there is to see, we can head to the final area, the media maze. Upon returning to the amphitheater, you can now see that there's a small amount of space under the stage. The media maze is split into two sections. There's the film and television wing and the music wing. I always go into the film and television wing first because it's self-contained. To enter either wing, you first have to go down an epileptic seizure-inducing tunnel with a violently annoying sound effect. This wing contains a lot of interesting wall textures. Both vanity and worldliness attack you here. I believe this makes sense, as much like the gallery. There's a lot of materialism in our visual and auditory art. Listen to your average pop of rap song. I tend to be more of a metal guy, but I enjoy rap, particularly the earlier rap from the late 80s and 90s. One issue I find with rap is that lyrically it is very materialistic. It comes from the culture of poverty that rap comes from. When you have nothing, you crave being able to climb out and get what was withheld from you. Money means escaping a world of crime. However, many problems we perceive as external are endemic to us. No matter how rich you become, you will always be stuck with yourself. It is why it is important to cultivate virtues and good habits. The primary goal of this wing is to open the scroll door. To do that, you need to find two numbers that you enter to unlock a door blocking access to the scroll door. These numbers can be located on the back of some moving panels and the ceiling in a weird room with film hanging down. There are some additional weird things to view while we're here. For one, we have a movie theater. Down here are actual movie posters that have been blurred or compressed to the point where you can't really tell what they are. I feel like one of them is Rambo, but I have no idea. Behind the final screen is a secret area. Another strange room is before you reach the number on the ceiling with the film strips. It's a room of what I think are celebrities' heads in negative colors that rise and fall from the floor. I'm pretty sure this dude is Pierce Brosnan. Upon getting close enough to the room, you get blasted with more seizure-inducing camera flashes. Once oh, yeah. we enter the two oh, numbers yeah. and open the door, we have to wade through a sea of dancing televisions. Whatever feels good, do it. Well, that certainly sounds like a philosophy humans love to live by. This quote, or a variation of the mantra Whatever for a type of philosophy, good. known as hedonism. Hedonism is the idea that pleasure is the highest thing one can strive for. It means a life in pursuit of self-indulgence. 
to defeat the door, read 1 John 2.15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We can learn a little more if we look at the following verses from 1 John 2.16-17 that aren't in the game. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. To me, this scroll does not provide me with a relevant enough counterpoint from the Bible to provide a defense for it. As Christians, we aren't to put our faith in the world and pursue pleasure as the goal. However, that does not mean we are supposed to walk across Legos in our spare time praying for the rapture. I think a more defensible position to defeat this worldly wisdom would be Matthew 6, 25-34, which says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is probably one of my favorite collections of Bible verses, as it always helps me frame my perspective back on God. God does not want us to loathe the earth. The world is a collective noun that refers to the amalgamations that comprise all things tempting and sinful. It is the reputation of heaven for temporary pleasure. In Genesis, the world is given to Adam and Eve to enjoy. It's a real you-had-one-job moment that humanity was successfully tempted away from paradise. It shows that when we think on the horizontal level of the earth, we lose access to the vertical. When we focus on God, we still have the pleasure and wonders of life, but it will be through a context of love for others rather than the self. We are to love ourselves, but not to the point of vanity. The love for God comes over all other loves. You know what else I love? Pressing buttons. Once we open the scroll door, we can proceed to the other wing of the maze. This wing is a series of hallways with some slamming music. Down the hallways, you can come across different rooms that have different styles of music playing. We've got funk, disco, new age, and a couple other genres that elude me. I think this one is supposed to be grunge, but it's just a bass guitar and what sounds like a roaring bear every few seconds. We also have a room with just drums and speakers. Some of the rooms are interesting. The hippie room with the new age music is an acid trip. We've got several dance floors. There's a mock band performing a rock song, including what I think is an image of Kurt Cobain. Similarly to the gallery of nothingness, what any of this means eludes me. There is even less commentary here than in the gallery. It's just rooms. We can find the final scroll of the level, which opens the scroll door in the Mall of Distractions. But other than that, there's nothing to indicate that the music is bad. If I am stretching my interpretations, I guess the backstage area with brick everywhere could be interpreted as modern music having negative messages as there are edgy words graffitied all over the wall. While this area is my favorite in the amphitheater of apathy, it leaves a little to be desired in the themes. If I were to take a stab at what the developers intended with the media maze based on how they tackled the subjects covered in different areas, I would say that they insinuate that modern media often contains negative messages. Sometimes we can become so wrapped up in media that we forget our responsibilities. It is an escape, after all. We can be blinded to the path forward by the media surrounding us. While I would say there is some merit to this message, I would also argue that God specifically told us to enjoy life. It isn't supposed to be lived in misery. We have the choice of what media to consume. We don't always know what we're in for when we watch something or listen to it, but if it causes you to stumble on your walk with God, or if by playing it in public as you might with music, it causes someone else to stumble, it is best to abstain from it. I'm a Christian and I watch all kinds of horror movies. I've seen some pretty extreme stuff. I used to watch it a lot more until I found myself thinking negatively. Now, I choose to consume it in moderation and steer clear of the stuff on the level of a Serbian film. And I'm in a lot better place.
I would never go up to someone I knew who had an issue with horror movies though and demand they watch them. Similarly, I listen to a wide variety of music. Some of my favorite music is a subgenre of metal called death metal and a subgenre of rap called horrorcore. The lyrics in these genres often talk about killing people and committing a whole other host of crimes against humanity. However, I'm not the kind of person who internalizes music on a soul level. To me, it's just music. For music people, though, they feel every bit of the lyrics. I can go to cattle decapitation concerts and go to church the next day, being none the worse for wear. However, I think it's totally reasonable for another Christian to have an issue with that and not participate. If I had to listen to nothing but worship music, I would never listen to music because I find worship music unbearably boring. My mind is never quiet, and unless my music is extremely involved, I get bored quickly. The media maze doesn't go anywhere near this kind of depth of critique, but just by the virtue that it made me think of it by reflecting, it inadvertently brought depth to the conversation. A piece of art is as good to an individual as can be argued a case for it. For someone who doesn't have a background as a Christian, Saints of Virtue might not bring up the same kind of depth. That isn't to say the Christian interpretation is superior, just that certain media is meant for certain audiences. If I jumped into a game based around Islamic, Buddhist, or Hindu themes, I would not have the same appreciation for them as someone who lives in that culture. I played a game recently that did exactly what I'm talking about. The Shiva is a point-and-click game from 2006 where you play a Jewish rabbi struggling with his faith. There was probably a lot of nuance and themes that were lost on me. I still enjoyed the game and enjoyed learning about a culture that shares some similarities with mine, though it's still quite different. We have now covered all five areas in the first level or realm of the game. We can leave the media maze, go back into the Mall of Distractions for the third and final time, and unlock the scroll door. The one with the most toys wins. How about the one with the most scrolls wins? The correct scroll is Matthew 6, 20-21, which says, Store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I would agree with the sentiment in this verse. The assailant might say, but what about clothes and housing? Isn't it good to enjoy the things that God gives us? I would say that the previous verse isn't meant to encourage abandoning all material possessions. There's something to be said about asceticism, or the avoidance of self-indulgence and unnecessary possessions, typically to grow one's faith. Perhaps the greatest support for living this lifestyle comes from Matthew 19, verse 21. This section of Matthew talks about a rich young ruler who asked Jesus how to have eternal life. Jesus responds by saying, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. The kicker in this verse is Jesus' word choice. Jesus mentions perfection. No human is capable of perfection. The rich young ruler didn't understand that perfection is not what God calls us to achieve. The purpose of Jesus was because humans are incapable of fulfilling the law, so God put himself into a form that was fully man and fully God to fulfill it. By fulfilling the law, we are now no longer required to live lives in perfection, but strive for a relationship with God where our hearts are changed by the grace of his actions. When we do have less stuff, it makes us rely more on God. Some of the people with the strongest faith I have met have been the homeless. When you have no certain home or food to eat, you draw near to God for provision. All this is just reminding us that where we truly put our value is where our heart is. Does our scroll provide a solid rebuttal? Yes, but as I have previously mentioned, many of these responses would probably not convince someone who did not believe in God. Let's blow this popsicle stand. When we exit the mall, the stage is now high enough for us to crouch under, open the exit door, and fall into the freaking void. Now we've done it. If you didn't quit after the first 15 minutes of the game, you probably will quit when you encounter the next realm. There are three more realms in this game. The next realm is the labyrinths of legalism, followed by New Age Nirvana, and finally the domain of the heart. These levels don't quite have the details of the first realm, unfortunately, but there are still some interesting areas, particularly in New Age Nirvana. The next realm is mostly a series of mazes with a couple of puzzles. We are dropped into a maze, what some might even call a twisty maze. As a kid, I don't think there was a more frustrating area in the whole game. It's got about every annoying mechanic I can think of to put into a maze. For starters, this level has the same exact texture the whole way through, so it's difficult to distinguish where you are based on recognizable landmarks and geography. There are missable key items upon which missing will require you to later backtrack through the next maze, plus this maze, to find them and give you the delightful opportunity to do this whole level over again. There are invisible one-way walls that you can pass through. This time it isn't due to a glitch. You pass through the walls and turn back around and find them sealed and you have to find your way back to where you were. 
This is particularly annoying because the exit to the maze is located right next to one of these walls around a hairpin turn that is easy to walk right past if you aren't paying attention. Using the minimap can somewhat help with identifying these walls as they have a different texture, but they're still easy to accidentally get trapped by. This is one of the areas where the soundtrack gets grating. The soundtracks in each area of this game are all pretty short loops that just repeat endlessly unless the sound glitches out. Kind of annoying, the transition between the end of the loop and the beginning of another isn't done seamlessly so sometimes you can hear this clipping jump in the music. One final thing to note, though this is not so much annoying as startling, is our new enemy. On this level you won't encounter vanity and worldliness, though we will see them again. Here is fear. Fear is my favorite design of the six enemy types. I always thought fear looked a little like Darth Maul from Star Wars, though now the only common factor is the red skin. Fear has glowing blue eyes, a locked collar, chains for hair, and what looks like half a ball from a ball and chain. I believe the design of this enemy references the Bible verse Romans 8.15 which says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. When we fear something or are in a state of fear, people typically have two responses that you've probably heard of before, fight or flight. We either run from our fear or we stand our ground and fight it. I believe, however, there is a third option, freeze. Sometimes we are just frozen and do nothing at all. The chains of fear immobilize you. Fear, the enemy that is, has one more interesting aspect, the way it attacks. Whereas vanity and worldliness just open fire from afar once they get within a certain range of you, fear sneaks up on you. It doesn't seem to always happen, but frequently fear gets right up behind you or in your face. This has led to many moments where I'm playing, where I'm running around and fear scares the crap out of me, causing my soul to leave my body. Fear's design makes it attempt to scare the player. It's pretty effective too. No matter how prepared I am for it, I always get started at least one or two times a playthrough. That isn't easy to do. I'm pretty much immune to jump scares. The mechanical design, in addition to the visual design, is why I think Fear is the most interesting of the enemies in the game. Anyway, down here in the Twisty Maze, there are three rocks you can collect. While technically you don't need them, I would highly recommend finding at least one, since if you lose the other item down here, it can be a royal pain to get it back. That other item is a lead pipe. You will need this to disable a trap shortly. There is also a scroll down here. Ah yes, didn't think we were abandoning scrolls anytime soon, did we? I don't know if you need this scroll. I've never mapped out which scrolls are vital ones in the game. I just usually pick them all up to avoid a headache since you have to visit pretty much every area in the game anyway. To exit this maze, it helps to have the map overlay on. When you find an area where the walls stop getting placed, and you walk down a corridor that according to the map should have a wall where there is none, stop before crossing the barrier and essentially turn left until you see a path where the ground slopes upward. After exiting, you will come into an area that looks like a dungeon. Don't walk into the rooms yet. Before we move on to the next nightmare of an area, I want to talk about what the Twisty Maze might represent. Back in the amphitheater, each area was a commentary on some way our society chooses to distract itself from our ever closer demise, or at least a side effect of living in a fallen world. In the labyrinth of legalism, each of these stages in the level should relate to how Christianity often turns away others because of the laws that are made by man. I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. For those of you who don't know, this is a denomination of Protestant Christianity. On a very basic level, one of the big differences between an Adventist and a Baptist is that Adventists observe the Sabbath on Saturday, just like Judaism. Adventists don't eat unclean meat, such as pork or shellfish. Many are vegetarians or vegans. As a kid, I grew up eating Morning Star veggie bacon and Loma Linda prime steak and fry chick, both of which are made from soy protein. I'm a hipster vegetarian, I guess. I was eating it before it was cool. Adventists believe in the soul sleep form of death, meaning that when you die, you remain dead until Christ's return. This differs from the Baptist belief that when you die, you go to heaven. Additionally, Adventists follow many of the Levitical and Deuteronomic laws of the Bible. I went to church school during 2nd, 3rd, and 4th grades. In 2nd grade, I had 5 other classmates. In 3rd grade, I had 2. I think going here is a reason why it took me so long to be able to be normal in social situations. I still dislike even mildly crowded spaces. This climate of so few people though really did shape me profoundly. I have such nostalgia for those three years. During recess, we got to go back into the woods where we fashioned a little fort that wasn't much more than some sticks. We'd get to play in the creek a couple times a year. There was a loft we could climb up in to read during reading time. Eventually, our old pastor retired and a new one came in. 
His views on Adventism were extreme and he was incompetent, held poorly founded beliefs, and generally was just a turkey. His doctrine contradicted what my family believed. His education was from a university that basically just gives you a degree as long as you show up. My parents left the church and I went to a different Christian school. This one was still small, but there were at least 150 people for most of my time there. I think my graduating class only had like 8 people though. It was cool because every student got a personal introduction at graduation. Even though I was at a Christian school, I sort of fell away from Christianity. I believed that God was real, but I didn't live a faith that included God in my day-to-day -day living. I gradually lost some of those rules from the Adventist church, but I still don't eat what is biblically considered unclean meat. When it comes to the twisty maze, there isn't anything inside the maze that could provide symbolism, so we have to think of the maze itself. If I were to liken legalism to a maze, there are some definite similarities between the two. It's confusing, there isn't a clear direction of what is right, sometimes you think you are doing something correctly but hit a dead end, navigating to find what you need is a challenge, around every turn is some nerd trying to stop you. Legalism attempts to take away the faith of belief and replace it with laws. By following the law, you are a good Christian. It seems to ignore Paul the Apostle's declaration in Ephesians 2, 8-9, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you. It is the gift of God, it is not from works, so no one may boast. Works, however, are not without merit. James 2:26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. True faith brings good works as a consequence of the faith. If one finds that they have no works, it does not necessarily mean their faith is dead, but it can be an indicator that one has not truly been changed or has a strained relationship with God. The Twisty Maze is a representation of how the system of legalism makes it difficult for us to navigate what we need to do in faith. Proceeding onward, you have now come to the Turnstile Maze. If you know the path, this maze only takes about a minute to complete. When you step into any of the rooms, it turns you around so you might regress or take the wrong path. The key to this section is to use the rocks. Throw the rock into the hallway you want to go to. Get spun around and simply go to the hallway with the rock in it. You can do this with a pipe, but you have to be sure to get it. I accidentally left it in this maze before when I didn't have rocks and it was difficult to retrieve it. The path is pretty simple. From the start, you need to go left one and then forward all the way to the end. This area doesn't have any collectibles in it as far as I know. As far as its connections to legalism, it is similar to the twisty maze. When we start having a large system of rules, it's easy to get turned around and regress. We can see this so often in the United States government. Regardless of your political affiliation, I think many would agree that our government frequently is ineffective at creating policy that changes things for the better. So much of it is corrupted by people with selfish motivations and money always spins things up. Exiting this maze, we come to a pillar. These are our scroll doors in this level. Currently we can't defeat this pillar. Why are they pillars, and what's the significance? Right now we don't know, but we'll understand soon. For now we enter the trap dungeon. This is also an annoying zone, but more bearable than the previous two. Upon entering, a fear head attacks you, but in the distance a new challenger approaches. These deal holes are called self-righteousness. That's an apt enemy for an area dealing with legalism. Just like the earlier Paul quote from Ephesians talked about, so often legalistic people get this aura of superiority, as if their walk is a divine sun that lights the path to all things wondrous. To introduce an enemy like this in an area called a trap dungeon suggests a connection between legalism and self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is a blue mask with what to me looks like a powdered wig and a clerical collar. While powdered wigs have historically been used by many different jobs and class levels, they are often associated with judges, aristocrats, and politicians, the exact kind of people who create laws. The clerical collar shows self-righteousness is not contained to just the secular world, but also to those who claim to know God. The secular judge and the Christian minister can sometimes serve the same purpose. The mechanic unique to these enemies is that some of your sword shots seem to glance off, almost as if they are dodging your attacks. If you want to be generous, you could say their dodge is symbolic of how politicians slip and slide between their statements, speaking much but saying little. This can be further cemented with their death animation. It doesn't happen every time, but sometimes upon defeat, their tongue will extend out, as if their lies and legal pedantry have finally caught up to them. Now that might seem like a generous interpretation, and that is what a large amount of this video is. 
A great deal of meaning derived from this game is drawing meaning between things in the game that haven't been explicitly linked or told to you. Much of the meaning I've derived from this game is purely reading into things in proximity and drawing lines as to how they might connect. However, I still think there is merit in inferring your own meaning when none is explicitly stated. In a more serious context, this might lead one into logical fallacy territory, but I don't care, I'm the writer here. Now where were we? Oh yeah, navigating the trap dungeon. The ground will rise and lower, which is annoying in the stock version of the game, where you don't have full control of the camera with the mouse. But with Saints X, it isn't much of an issue. Traps defeated, atheists. There are pits to fall into, but if you use the mini-map and just keep your red dot out of the pits, you can breeze right through them. At the end of the left passage, you can find a secret wall that lets you get a view of what we're trying to destroy. The text reads, Before you stands the Palace of Pride. Within these walls, pride pronounces judgment over your life, and fear shackles you with heavy burdens. In this text, self-righteousness is called pride. For the sake of consistency, I will continue to refer to them as self-righteousness. This little bit of text gives us some larger context as to the overall spiritual journey of the game. After defeating apathy, we have fallen into the clutches of legalism. Fear and self-righteousness try to claim us, shackling us to the man-made rules instead of the freedom that Christ truly brings. To reiterate Romans 8.15, we are not slaves to fear. When presented with the distant view of the Palace of Pride, we are given a view of what we must destroy. That pillar we encountered earlier? That is one of the pillars we must destroy to topple the temple. As an aside, I don't know if destroying the pillars is a biblical allusion to Samson, a biblical figure known for using his super strength to knock down the pillars of a temple, killing a bunch of Philistines, but I'm going to go ahead and say it is, because I'm the writer. Anyway, the trap dungeon is pretty linear. There are three lines you go down, and I do the other lines before getting to the next section. One trap of note includes a wall that falls. You need to throw the pipe you got in the twisty maze and lodge it under the wall so you can crawl under. A couple of rooms over, the ceiling drops down, but not all the way. You shouldn't take damage if you crouch when you enter. The final trap is the closing walls. If you play Saints X, these won't be as fast, but you basically activate them and run back to the start. There's a corridor behind the walls that you can go down to get a scroll and our first of two additional useless weapons. Unless you're playing Saints X. Because of the previously mentioned frame rate tying into mechanics in the game's clock, even with a speed upgrade, the other two weapons fire too slow to be much use except for a couple of sections at the very end of the game. Now that we're done, we can head to our next area, the trap room. The trap room is one of the smaller areas in the game. On the far wall, a door is locked with red lights indicating switches that need to be flipped. There isn't much in the way of thematic elements here, but I'll mention them as we solve each trap. Going left, we need to pull the correct chain on the wall to raise the stairs to our first lever. The chain is the furthest one on the right when looking at the wall at the end of the path. Next to the moving platforms, when you jump on a pillar, it moves. You have to trial and error your way across. Follow the path of my playthrough through the correct sequence. Returning and taking the high path, a discolored stone is on the wall. Push this to disable a trap where a cage falls on you and softlocks you until you reload. Heading up, step on the discolored tile to disable the crushing ceiling. Press the brick on the right to disable the pinching walls. Next, step on the stepping stones in the correct order to raise the pillar enough to crawl under. I still don't remember the correct order. You only need a couple to get under, though. When you flip the switch, it doesn't do anything. Surprise, nerd, it's a fake switch. The real one is on the back. Don't make yourself have to do the stepping stone puzzle again. Next, head down to where the cage would drop on you. Prepare to cry, it's the turnstile mechanic again. Just walk slowly so you don't skid too badly when you get yeeted. Finally, you have to platform across more pillars to get to a switch under the platform that leads to the door. Once all five levers, six if you include the fake one, have been flipped, the door will open and you can get out of here. The only symbolism here is the trickery the trap room uses. If you go in here blind, you will probably have to reload a few times. The trickery is indicative of the previously established idea that self-righteous tries to trap its victims with ruses and technicalities that can ultimately lead to dead ends. Leaving the trap room, we are in a lobby of sorts and can head down a new path to the abstract maze. I won't be spending much time here because the commentary is one note. It's a maze. Mazes in the context of legalism can represent the constant warming and confusing ways laws both judicial and religious trap us. Boom. Done. Make sure to pick up the scroll at the bottom of the maze and on top of the maze before finding your way out. It isn't hard to trace your path. Do what all kids do at some point. Look at the end of the maze and trace your way back. Set a spot you need to get to and draw your way there. Fear is your enemy here. 
they do cause fear here because they suddenly pop up from the depths of the maze and attack. The knockback on their attacks can easily knock you off of the maze, resetting your progress. There are only a couple of elevators back up and none of them are near the exit. Once you leave, you're ready for our final path. Down this long hallway is a prayer altar. Finally, we enter the rules maze. We encounter signs along the path that give us directions. Some signs are in red and some in black. You want to follow the black signs and do the opposite of what the red signs say. If I was feeling vindictive, I could say, But don't some Bibles put Jesus' words in red? Are you saying to disobey Jesus? But that's a bit of a stretch. As usual, we're hunting for scrolls and any power-ups you may need. The rules maze states through its mechanics that some laws are to be followed and some are not. As to the scope of this, that is up to one's willingness to extrapolate. Romans 13, 1-7 can give us some enlightenment about what one is to do biblically regarding laws. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authority of God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. The Bible says that we are to follow the laws of our land. Governments were placed there by God. This goes back to the Old Testament. King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and all the mostly garbage kings of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles were instated because people asked for a king. God wanted to have a relationship with his people. However, man would not follow God's will. Once man decided to be ruled, God gave people over to the rule. He didn't abandon his people, though. When things got bad, God would send a prophet to put Israel back in line. However, this obedience never stuck. In Hosea, God describes it as the morning dew. How it'll be there, but then it goes away. Essentially, after the last prophet, there's a 400 year gap in the story until we hear from him again in the Bible in the form of Jesus' birth. However, that does not mean God went and took a nap. There are many apocryphal and pseudepigraphal texts. These are texts that were not included in the Bible that was compiled by the Council of Nicaea or later compilers of the Bible. These councils were where early church fathers laid down the doctrine that is foundational for modern day Christianity. This is a large oversimplification of events, but I am no biblical scholar by any stretch of the imagination. However, I also wanted to know why Christians believe the current books of the Bible are accurately depicting God. Why are some texts included and others thrown out? There is not a single answer. Some were not widely circulated enough to be credible. Others were written so long after the events that they were not verifiably accurate. Another reason is that all the members of the council retreated and spent time praying and meditating, and all of them came back with the exact list of books in the first book we called the Bible. There are other reasons, but I'll leave the deep theology for a video that isn't about a video game that looks like an acid trip. Tangent aside, rulers are here because we asked for them. If the government was placed by God, why has government throughout history largely been corrupt and evil? This goes to the idea of free will. If God is a God worthy of worship, he must be good. I would not willingly worship an evil God. If you believe that we have free will, the ability to, at least from our perspective, control the direction of our lives and how we live it, then a good God would let you exercise that free will. If we freely elect a bad government that is not godly, we are enacting our own free will, and God is not going to infringe upon that. To take away free will is to make one a slave, and the Bible is clear that we are not slaves under God. The same goodness is why bad things happen to good people. If God is only there to be our tool to wipe away the bad, we are using God. Our ways are not his ways. I've heard the argument I'm making phrased way better by much more educated people than I, so I hope what I mean by this is clear. Bad laws and governments exist because we have the free will to make them exist. God let us choose to instate them. Some might argue that we don't have free will. This is the idea of predestination. The idea that our entire lives are already predetermined before we are born. 
It is one of the core beliefs of Calvinism. However, particularly in newer forms of Calvinism, this is its own kinds of legalism. To defeat legalism, we must choose what is right and wrong. This is the symbol that these signs create. Finally, we come to a desert. This is more of the same rules as before, but with a twist. You have to follow the black signs and just completely ignore the red signs. These signs have a bit of a quirk. You need to move right up to them or the game won't register you as having been to the sign. I assume this is so you have to follow the signs instead of just roaming around the desert till you find the exit, since it is only after the final sign that you can hear a door slide open. Make your way through the final enemies, pick up the scroll, and get ready to crack some pillars. Pillar 1 says, you can be good enough to get into heaven. The game says the verse is Ephesians 2.10, but it is actually Ephesians 2.8-9 which reads, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2.10 actually says, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The irony of them listing this verse instead of the intended verses is not lost on me, though I haven't done translation comparisons to see if there's a translation where Ephesians 2.10 says the verse given in the game. The Bible isn't contradicting itself by saying that we are saved by faith and then saying that good works are what we're meant to do. As I've stated earlier in the video, good works are evidence of a living faith. They aren't the only determining factor. Humans are not single shades. Good people do bad things and bad people do good things. We all start in innocence and only with the onset of sin do we become corrupted. I would argue there are no bad people, only people being used by sin. The next pillar says, follow all the rules, that's all that matters. The correct response is Romans 3.20, which says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of our sin. This verse is in the context of a much larger passage talking about the legalism of the Pharisees and the Jewish tradition of following the law. Paul is writing that we are saved by faith. Following laws do not make us righteous because no one is righteous. The law exposes our unrighteousness. The third pillar claims that Christianity is a great burden because of its many rules. If I had a dollar for every time I have heard that one before. The response is Galatians 5.1 which says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. This section of Galatians actually talks about circumcision and how the Jewish men would boast that circumcision set them apart as righteous. Paul argues that Jesus freed us from this need to set ourselves apart from others through ritual as part of saving grace. Customs and rituals can still play a role and are some of my favorite parts of religion, but when they become a shackle, it defeats their purpose. The final pillars say, image is everything. Proverbs 21.2 responds, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. This is the only pillar where the response does not make much sense to me. The verse claims that you can lead the perfect life in your actions, but at the core of who you are begrudges it the entire time, it is not changed by your faith. You have accomplished nothing. So in the abstract it works, but in direct response not the strongest response. With all four pillars cracked, we have toppled the palace of pride and overcome legalism. Two of four levels down. As an aside, this might also be a stretch, but I just noticed it while writing this script. There are four levels in this game. The story is a visual abstraction of the process of changing one's heart from a worldly heart to one where Christ rules. There are four chambers in a heart. Could each level represent one of the chambers? I don't have any evidence that this means anything, but I thought it would be an interesting thing to note. Well, we're halfway through the game. These last two levels tend to be a bit longer because of the large amount of backtracking and confusing layouts. The next level is an absolute nightmare with the inventory system, if you're playing the original game. If you aren't using Saints X, this game is unstable and crashes frequently enough to be annoying. The next level requires you to carry more items than you have inventory for. As a consequence, you have to drop items and come back for them. However, if the game crashes, it doesn't remember where you dropped the item, and they are no longer in your game. This effectively makes the game unbeatable, and you have to revert to an earlier save. I hope you have one. The only way I got around this was by knowing what was behind each scroll door and only opening them when I knew I could take them directly where they needed to go. Level 3 is probably my favorite of the Thor levels visually because of how strange it is. This is the New Age Nirvana. We've pissed off the atheists, agnostics, catholics, and southern baptists. Now we're coming for the East Asian religions like Buddhism and Hinduism. The overall goal of this level is to destroy the god of the New Age. 
The god is a giant statue of yourself located in the Temple of Man. To destroy it, you need to build the Hammer of Truth from a rod and a hammerhead. However, there is a force field protecting the statue. To disable that, we will need to find three blocks with Hebrew letters on them. Where do we find all these things? Behind scroll doors. This level is where any depth of commentary that the game might have had before comes to a screeching halt. The story of this level is interesting and can be mined for some meaning, and the enemies are thematically appropriate, but most of these areas are just temples and shrines with very little that I can extrapolate any kind of meaning from. This map sprawls and has a lot of shrines to visit. It is very easy to miss stuff here. It does have some banging music though, and you're going to hear it over and over and over. We start by entering the Love and Peace Temple. We immediately come across our first new foe, self-glorification. When they shoot their fireballs, a crown of electricity emanates from around their head. I don't know if this is supposed to be an allusion to Christ wearing a crown of thorns. To me, it would make sense since the pinnacle of self-glorification is to deify oneself. It also invokes the Greek tradition at the OG Olympic Games of placing an olive leaf on the heads of winners. This would fit with the visual design of the Temple of Love and Peace being somewhat Greek. The olive branch is also a symbol of peace, so... <coughs> Self-glorification also has the Eye of Providence on its head. This is the symbol you see on American currency, and is often associated with the Illuminati. In Christianity, this Eye means Divine Providence. The triangle represents the Holy Trinity. Self-glorification's most pronounced mechanic is that when you kill the mask, the golden guru on the back of its head detaches and attacks you. This nerd is pretty weak, but he's fast. It is posed in a classical meditation pose that one can often see in artwork of Hindu gods. Oh, yeah. Self-glorification is a sin because it attempts to credit the self rather than God. Biblically, all we are given comes from God. When we credit ourselves, we rob God of the glory he deserves. As we make our way through the Love and Peace Temple, we can find a power-up for the Twin Sword. There are some paintings, but I'm not really sure of the style. I want to say it's Baroque. I always start by taking the left-hand path that leads to the gardens. Oh, the gardens. Welcome to the music played in the gardens of hell. We can collect a scroll up in the gondola. Proceeding to the other side of the gardens, we can find a hedge maze. In the hedge maze is a scroll door that says, God is love and would never hurt anyone. The response is Romans 2.5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God is a God of love. Just like a parent must discipline a child so that they can learn how to behave properly, so too does the Heavenly Father discipline his children when they go against his will. Our judgment is brought upon us only by our inability to lead perfect lives. It is only by realizing this and repenting that we can start the process of sanctification. Once we're done with the scroll door and escape the hedge maze, we are done here for now. Head down the only untaken path and through a long cave. Eventually you will come to a crossroads. Go straight till you come to the blue building. This is the Shrine of Heaven. The music here always makes me feel kind of weird. Head left first and get the loot, then right. By this point in my walkthrough I was out of ammo. You do not want to get stuck and have to stab these dudes if you aren't playing with the fan patch to fix the frame rate damage relationship. Hack through the place until you come to a door where you can use the key you got in the pool back in the Love and Peace Temple. You can push a discolored wall here to get super armor. Much needed by me. There is also a scroll in here. There are several smaller temples outside the main temple that each contain objectives of varying importance. The green building on the right contains nothing of note. The next building over has a series of bells you have to ring all at the same time to get a medallion to appear. This coin unlocks the Earth Shrine. The next building has a maze with a scroll door that we can't open yet. The next building is pure darkness. There is really nothing useful inside other than just some generic power-ups. The final building contains a scroll and power-ups. Let's pause here and examine the Shrine of Heaven and its outlying buildings. What are these trying to say? I'm gonna be honest, the main shrine is just a bunch of rugs and tables with eye-melting textures. The first building had statues of the Guru enemy balancing the earth in its hands. I have almost no knowledge of Hinduism. The extent of my knowledge of Buddhism comes from a single class on Buddhism that I took for my minor in religious studies and a world religions class that I took back in community college during a four week truncated semester by a guy who was about as culturally aware as a man who is not culturally aware. Good old Dr. Dick. 
I couldn't tell you if there was a deity that holds the world. I know in Christianity, God is sometimes referred to as having the world in his hands, so maybe it's a play on that. There's also the idea that the whole world is on the back of a turtle, who is on the back of another turtle, who is on the back of another turtle, and so on and so on. It is called infinite regression, meaning that there is no end to how deep one can go spiritually because there is always more just behind the next curtain. The bell temple feels like it might have something to say, but I am unaware of any significance of bells other than their traditional use in churches and as objects of religious summoning and timekeeping. Cursory research on Google says that they evoke spiritual power and signify important events. The maze temple is just yet another maze. The dark temple is, well, dark. The final temple has pictures of animals and a human on the wall. This could reference the idea of animalism. Animalism is the idea that humans are just animals. Eric Olson wrote an argument to describe animalism in 2003 in his paper Personal Identity that states, 1. A person that occupies a given space also has a Homo sapiens animal occupying the same space. 2. The Homo sapiens animal is thinking. 3. The person occupying the space is thinking. 4. Therefore, a human person is also a human animal. Whatever floats your boat, bro. Sounds needlessly pedantic to me. I don't much care whether I'm an animal or not. We are the only living creatures on this planet that have a depth of thought to ponder our existence. To me, that is indicative of human beings being set apart from other animals. Additionally, on the wall, there's also a picture of an alien. There are some people that think that there is no god, but we are all just the product of a bunch of aliens who have placed us here, and we're just a big experiment to see how we evolve. After all that jazz, we're ready to head to our next area. Head back to the crossroads before the Shrine of Heaven and swing a right to the Earth Shrine. This is the round coin thing you got from ringing the bells over in the Shrine of Heaven. The decor here echoes Japanese design, though I get the weird design of a lot of 90s Christian media. If you've ever read books and seen images of 90s Christian media, you'll know what I'm talking about. Strange, barren, white-walled rooms with sparse ornamental paintings and vases distributed around on tables and walls. In the halls, we meet the final new enemy, oh, yeah. Arrogance. Arrogance is a pretty good design, in my opinion. It looks as if he's glowering down at you with his eyes narrowed and eyebrows furrowed. His long, narrow nose protrudes upward and his mouth remains in a disapproving smirk. He also seems to have a powder wig, similar to self-righteousness. When he attacks, he spits out two blue orbs. He can turn and rapidly move from one spot to the next. Unlike most of the other enemies, Arrogance's appearance doesn't make any significant commentary on anything. Most of Arrogance's appearance is details we associate with the trait of Arrogance. The powdered wig is the only detail that I think has any connotations. As stated with self-righteousness earlier, I often think of a powdered wig as being associated with the aristocracy or politicians. Does this imply that arrogance is a commentary on how politicians and high society people are often arrogant? Probably not, but as you've surmised, we have to read Saints of Virtue with a relative scale. Very little is explicitly told to us, as most of this is an inference based on context clues and my own knowledge of religious traditions. Both arrogance and self-glorification seem to be aptly placed in New Age Nirvana. A good chunk of New Age Nirvana plays on what I call universalism. There is a continually rising contingent of people who believe in God, but not any one religion's God in particular. They pick and choose what elements they think resonate with their idea of God. In a way, this is creating your own God, which in other religions is called idolatry. Back in the Shrine of Earth, simply make your way through the rooms. The only thing of note here is the painting on the wall that lifts and allows you to crouch under the wall and collect a scroll among a couple of masks. Once you've acquired the scroll, head back out to the crossroads and head straight across to the Mountains of Relativity. I like the name of this area, even though it's a nightmare to navigate. Go through the first arch and hang a right to come to a shrine with no entrance. You must enter through the roof. You can climb the rocks on the side to get in. Inside is a scroll. You could ignore the other pathway for now as it takes you to the Temple of Man. We need a key first. Head back to the arch and head further into the mountains, avoiding the falling rocks and enemies. As you wind your way through the mountains, explore the side paths as you come across them. You will come across other shrines. One has a scroll that reads, Many ways lead to heaven. The biblical reputation of this assertion is found in John 14:6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Matthew 10, 32-33 also says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. The idea that many ways lead to heaven is called relativism. Relativity is a strange concept to tackle. 
Everything in life is relative to something. Comparison and scaling are how we make decisions. We compare our situations to ones we have faced before, as well as those of other people. We don't make a conscious decision about this. It often occurs in mere seconds. Relativity related to religion would be talking about relativism. Relativism in general is the denial of objective reality. Relativism in a religious aspect is the idea that your own path to God is the right path. Philip L. Quinn was a philosopher and theologian. In his book Relativism and Religion, he writes, Naturalism holds that all religions are mistaken. Religious exclusivism maintains that only one world religion is correct, and all others are mistaken. Religious inclusivism contends that only one world religion is fully correct, but others contain some of the truth of the one correct religion. Religious subjectivism claims that each world religion is correct in the sense that it is good for those who adhere to it. Religious pluralism asserts that ultimately all world religions are correct, each offering a different salvific path and partial perspective on a single transcendent reality. And religious relativism argues that at least one, and probably more than one, world religion is correct, and that correctness of a religion is relative to the worldview of its community of adherents. If I had to describe my own beliefs, I would say I best fit a religious inclusivist. I believe that all religions strive to find God. I believe each religion has a piece of God. Presently, we don't have the scroll for this door. There is another scroll in the mountains across a broken bridge. Jump across the planks, grab the scroll, and head to the bottom of the mountain path. You have to jump across a couple of pillars to get a key. With the two scrolls and key, we can leave here for now and head to the Temple of Man. Once there, activate the teleporters to save time later. I'm not really sure who anyone on the walls is in this first section. The Temple of Man is a location designed around man's achievements. Our first stop will be the library. I think of this library as representing the culmination of man's knowledge. One of the ways humans shield themselves is with their knowledge. If you know a lot, you can do a lot. Of course, any time one becomes knowledgeable, there is always the risk of arrogance and self-glorification. We see this in academic settings with regularity. I had more than one professor in college who seemed to think that they were the reason the students showed up. A gold key is the only thing we need from the library. After acquiring that, head to the locked gate further in the temple. This leads to an amphitheater where the seats face a giant golden statue of your character's model as their real self. Upon trying to shoot the statue, we are informed it is protected by a force field. We have to use the three Hebrew letters to disable the force field at a console hidden behind a pillar. We're not quite there though. First we need to take care of these side rooms. Down one wing are statues that represent human success. Money, awards, and treasures, all made of gold, serve as reminders of man's achievements. Down the pathway directly behind the statue is a room with various country flags. I think this is supposed to evoke the idea of the United Nations, especially because there's a United Nations flag on the wall. It has been my experience that some Christians are concerned that the United Nations is an attempt to rebuild the Tower of Babel in a societal context. I'm not sure if I would go that far. To me, unification should always be the goal, as that is what heaven is going to be. All people are humans, and heaven will be filled with people of every possible nationality and race. Down the final wing, we see showcases of mankind's achievements, from computers to the moon landing to hair dryers and basketballs. Okay, the achievements displayed aren't the best showcase of mankind's creations. There's a scroll door, but ignore it for now. We need the three Hebrew letters before we build the last item we need. For now, head back to the Shrine of Heaven using the teleporter at the entrance to the Temple of Man. Head for the building with the maze in it that we couldn't open earlier. This door says, we can create our own truths. The correct response is Romans 125, which reads, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. I had a teacher in high school who came up with a quote that has stuck with me. He said, once you see and know truth, you can't unsee it. Therefore, you have a responsibility to it. I believe this quote wholeheartedly. However, I believe that humans are also susceptible to believing that a lie is truth. When someone believes they have the truth, the only way they will let it go is if they change their mind. When we think of truth, it is hard to define. As we discussed with relativity, what's true for me is not necessarily true for you. I can think pizza is the most wonderful food on earth, but someone else may say it tastes terrible. The truth is true for both of us, yet they contradict each other. There is a difference between subjective truth and objective truth. I believe that objective truth is the thing that most humans who live to adulthood are always seeking. Why are we here? 
This is the universal question that we have asked since recorded history, and probably much earlier as well. I do not believe there are multiple ways to heaven. As a Christian, I believe Jesus is the only way. To me, this is the objective truth, even though that statement is subjective. I do believe that how you come to the conclusion of Jesus doesn't have to be a particular way. I knew of Jesus and claimed to be a Christian for my entire life. However, it wasn't until I was 20, when I read Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship, that I really got Jesus. I didn't come to Christ through the Bible directly. I came to him through a man who tried to kill Hitler. There is only one path, but there are many ways to find that path. Not all conversion comes through a church service. As we read the verse, we get access to our second Hebrew letter. Next, head back and take the teleporter to the Love and Peace Temple. Head to the scroll door which reads, We are all good by nature. The scroll that opens this door is Romans 3.23 which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is a contention of people who believe that simply being a good person gets you into heaven. Similarly, some people think religion makes you a good person. Neither of these ideas are true from a Christian perspective. Christians believe there are no bad people, only people being used by sin. Humans are born to worship God. Through various lives of the world, we are turned away to pursue the flesh. We can perform bad acts, but the only bad person is the one who is unrepentant and blasphemes the Holy Spirit. The sum of Christianity is to love God with your entire being and to love others as if they were you. This is all that matters. We must love everyone. That doesn't mean we get to pick and choose based on what we think the person deserves. From a certain perspective, none of us deserve love because everyone sucks on some level. But God is a being so unfathomably merciful that he loves even the unlovable. It is hard to describe to someone who does not believe in God why a Christian believes. When you actually experience God, you no longer have a choice but to believe. To me, the idea of rejecting God is like denying gravity exists. The effects of gravity are felt and seen by all. You can't physically see gravity, but you know it is there because you've experienced it. You can see its effects. God is the same way, at least from my experiences. There are examples all throughout history of people seeing manifestations of God, but we don't see that now. I believe that God interacts with people according to the times and culture in which we live. Early cultures were much more likely to believe in the supernatural. Today, even in cultures that are theocratic, science has made the supernatural seem much less possible. I have felt God most strongly in the moments when I am at my worst. It is only when I have nowhere else to turn that I hear God in a way that is undeniably Him. It is not a literal audible sound, but an inner knowing. With all three Hebrew letters, we can return to the temple and slot them in the stand hidden behind the pillar to disable the force field around the God of the New Age. The rune that looks like an X is the Hebrew letter Aleph, which stands for A, Aleph. The letter that looks like a fancy O is Mem, which stands for M. The letter which looks like a 7 or an upside down L is Daled. Together they say Aleph Mem Daled, which is one way to spell Adam in Hebrew. However, Hebrew is written right to left instead of left to right, so this is technically incorrect. With the force field disabled, we can collect the parts of the hammer of truth to knock down the statue. The closest door is in the showcase room with all the human achievements in it. The worldly wisdom says you are your own god. This quote doesn't have a singular source, but it is present in some New Age religions. Several versions of Satanism assert that you are your own god. The Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey asserts that the self is the most important part of life and pleasure should be sought above all else. Personally, even if I wasn't a Christian, I think selflessness and acts of kindness toward others are a better way to live. Pantheism is the idea that God is a collective unity of all things, and thus, God is in everyone and everything. The verse used to combat the worldly wisdom is Psalms 100 verse 3, which reads, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. The game leaves out the last third of the verse, which says, We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Creationism and evolutionism are two systems of cosmology that are often positioned as opposites. I do not know how the world began. It is an important question to many who are deciding if they should follow a faith or not. My experience as a Christian is that I am still curious as to the answer of these questions, but following Christ gives me assurance that these questions aren't important in the view of eternity. There is evidence that the earth is far older than most Christians believe. I do not know why many Christians are intent on thinking the earth is 10,000 years old. I think it has to do more with humanity's unwillingness to change a belief when presented with new evidence. 
I have no idea whether the literal creation story is real or if God created the matter of the universe and the system of evolution to create life. It doesn't matter because I'm here and I can either choose to follow God or live my life how I see fit. What I do know is that the Bible is not a factual account of the history of the world. There are many books which contain factual history, but there are many other genres in the book which aren't meant to be read literally. It is a collection of books that have been synthesized into a single text. There are books of history, poetry, apocalypse, letters, prophecy, and more. Just as I don't grab my Robert Frost collection and assume everything is literal, I don't assume everything in the Bible is literal. I read it, study it for what it is, and ask what it can teach me. Now that we have the heavy metal head, we can headbang on back over to the mountains of relativity and grab the final piece for this level. The scroll door says, many ways lead to heaven. We've already talked about this door, so now that we have the head and the shaft, we can fit them together to make the hammer of truth. Yeet the hammer at the statue and listen to yet another track of the worst Christian rock I have ever heard. New Age Nirvana was my favorite of the Four Realms as a kid because of the strange loneliness it provides. Now that I'm older, I like the nostalgia of the first realm the best, but I still like the bizarre designs of the third realm. Now we're on to the domain of the heart. As saints of virtue, we must find the way to the temple of our hearts and place a ruler on the throne. Only truth holds the keys to the kingdom. Beware. The enemies of worldliness, self-righteousness, self-glorification, and arrogance will put us to the ultimate test. This last level is really the only challenging level of the game. Not only are there a buttload of enemies, but if you have a computer that is faster than a toaster, it is literally unbeatable without the Saints X fan patch or limiting your frame rate using DOSBox or some other program. The first area here is the Swamps of Selfishness. This area is easily my least favorite next to maybe the Turnstile Maze. Prepare to see a lot of mud and rock and not much else. Much like many other locations in the game, this place is a big maze with a lot of crap to remember. This realm as a whole doesn't have as much backtracking as the last realm, but each area is quite large in comparison. You basically need to explore every pathway to get all the scrolls and power-ups. The ground looks like mud, but there are certain darker patches that pull you down and kill you. If you don't have a frame-limiting tool, it will do this too quickly to escape. This doesn't become a problem until you have to wade through a pool of it to get to a scroll. Another open area has a wall that can be moved. I recall having opened it in the past, but for the life of me in my recent playthroughs, I can't figure out how to open it. If I recall correctly, I think it is just some health and armor and ammo for the sword launcher. Now we just work our way through the pathways, collecting any power-ups and scrolls that you find. Eventually you'll come across the poison pond. You can't make it right now unless you cheat. The way you are supposed to get across this is to get a super health power up in the trash dump you find later on. With the base version of this game, it runs too fast and I would die even with the health power up when I cross the pond as the damage is tied to the frame rate. Cranking down the frame rate using DOS or using the Saints X fix will provide a workaround to this. The significance of poison being in the swamps of selfishness could imply that selfishness is a poison. In keeping something from others, you are only harming yourself by not sharing the abundance that God has gifted. Biblically, everything we have is a blessing from God. We are called to be good stewards of what he has given. This theme could have better been expressed if poison were linked with how easy it is for the tongue to get us in trouble. The Bible repeatedly refers to the tongue as poison or poisoning the user who lets the tongue rattle off without constraint. A couple stops along the way include a big pool of mud that hampers your progress and a river of rotting garbage that contains a couple underwater caves with a scroll and power-ups. Next comes the Plane of Things. This is one of those areas where you really feel like they just ran out of ideas. It's just a bunch of pits with random objects in them and enemies. On the positive side, there is a super shield down here if you didn't get it on the last level. This is mainly an area that leads to the trash dump. There are two main sections of the trash dump. There's the more open section where you can find power-ups and kill some enemies, and then a closed off section where walls move in to crush you. Trash being in the domain of the heart is symbolic of how we often store up a lot of random things that are just garbage in our hearts. How often do we tell ourselves lies about who we are that just aren't true? We aren't ugly, we aren't stupid, we aren't weird, we are all worthy of love, and anyone who says otherwise can get bent. It is only under all the garbage that we find the strength to overcome that poison that we have let in our lives. When we find the health power up here, that is what we can take away. Once you have the power up, you can leave the dump and go across the poison pond if you are like me, then you can proceed to the next section. We'll be stopping and opening a scroll door that says, please yourself first. The correct refutation of this is John 13, 34 through 35. The game reads, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. 
This is a crucial verse in the Christian faith. It connects with Matthew 22:37 through 40 in which Jesus recites the two greatest commandments for Christians to follow. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. These are commandments that I feel many fellow Christians forget, especially concerning the LGBTQI community. Homeless people, addicts, prostitutes, people of other faiths, and people of other life philosophies. We are called to love all, not some. My church is a church that always puts this verse, and I'm blessed to have them. Before I came to know Christ, I did not love very many people. I tend to be rather insular and don't like socializing very much. I still would rather be at my home than at a party, but I've developed compassion for other people through my experiences doing local mission work and volunteering at a ministry that helps people in poverty. Speaking of poverty, we are now no longer impoverished in our inventory as we pick up the key of faith. Continuing down the path, we eventually come to the ruins of pride. These are the ruins of the palace of pride from the second level. As a kid, and to a lesser extent as an adult, I find this area kind of eerie. The music is unnerving and the enemies pop out from behind the ruins and can jump scare you if you aren't paying attention. I also find this area frustrating. Because the ruins all look the same, it is hard to figure out where you are. There are also two more areas where the frame rate issues can cause you to softlock the game. In the first ruin area, there is a scroll on what almost seems like a parking deck if there were any cars in the game and the floors were taller. The music in the first ruin section is this desolate sound of wind blowing. While repetitive, much like all the music in this game, it makes the area seem like something is hiding and watching you. The next area has a short drum loop with what I can only describe as alien sounds. If anybody knows the name of these kinds of sounds, let me know because I've heard them in a few other beats. It almost reminds me of the tinny, wobbling sound of a low-quality microphone. There's multiple scrolls here. Eventually, you'll come to another scroll door. This door says, you can do everything under your own power. The verse to refute this worldly wisdom is Philippians 4 verse 13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Christian walk is one of submission. We submit to God because he is greater. In the Christian walk, weakness is strength. When our will aligns with God's will, we can do things greater than if we set out on our own. This goes in the face of modern conventional wisdom, which is very much about self-empowerment. That isn't to say a person shouldn't feel good about themselves or enjoy doing challenging things. It's just that Christians should not contribute these things to themselves. We recognize that all things come from God, and without His grace, we would be hopeless and doomed. I do think this wisdom is apt for a place called the Ruins of Pride. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. It should be no surprise that the palace of pride reaped what it sowed. Opening the scroll door, we get the key of hope. Hope is what we find when we submit to Christ, when we realize that the walk of service, submission, and love is what makes life an experience that flourishes, we find hope. In the next area of the ruins are a bunch of standing stones. Eventually you'll come across a path that goes up on a plateau, and you have to push a boulder down to knock down some of the pillars to create a bridge across a ravine. If you aren't using Saint X or limiting your frame rate, the boulder will not knock down the pillars, and you won't be able to jump far enough to get over the ravine. There is a scroll on the other side that I'm fairly certain is required, as I got softlocked here during my practice run back when I recorded my walkthrough. After you get all the scrolls and the key from the ruins, you can proceed to the Paths of Perseverance. The paths are one of two areas in this last level that I feel are just lazy. The paths are just a really long pathway filled with enemies that ends in an opening absolutely packed with arrogance heads. Arrogance are bullet sponges. Theoretically, one could use the sword launcher to clear them out quickly, but due to the fire rate being tied to your frame rate, you could replay half the game in the amount of time you have to wait between shots. And even then, it doesn't do much more damage than just blasting them with a the regular sword. The section drains your ammo. As a kid, I had a lot of trouble in this section, and I didn't know you could run, so I couldn't really dodge effectively. Following this section is a long hallway with slits in the walls that fire fireballs. I think you're supposed to be able to dodge this if you're patient, but I guess I haven't cultivated that fruit of the spirit yet, as sprinting and jumping like a madman is how I always get through with minimal damage. After that is a long and winding hallway that is completely dark. You can kind of illuminate it with shots from your sword if you have any left from the throng of arrogance heads. There's a couple sneaky boys that try to light you up, but they don't pose much of a threat. We're almost there. We are now outside the temple of our heart. There are alcoves on the back side of the cliffs with self-righteousness in them and power-ups, but you can ignore these if you aren't trying to kill all the enemies or aren't low on supplies. You need to jump up the scaffolding on the right side and... To open the gate to your heart, proceed to a big ground area. This is the final hub before we beat the game. Flowing through the middle of it is the River of Life which will refill your health. You'll probably need it unless your name is Rembrandt Dark Soulsman and have pro-dodging skills. 
With the door you came in at your back, go into the first room on your right. This takes you to the land of dreams. If you have epilepsy, you may want to look away. This is less the land of dreams and more the land of psychedelic imbibement. You can skip this area if you want, as there aren't any scrolls or scroll doors here, it just has power-ups. When you leave the land of dreams, head to the door straight across from you to enter the Garden of Peace. The river of life runs through it, so make sure to utilize it if your health gets low. Simply make your way through the garden until you come to a waterfall. Below the water is a secret area and a scroll to the right of the waterfall. There aren't any scroll doors here. Back into the hub, go to the door to the left of the land of dreams. There is a locked door that opens with the key of hope. You are now entering the Vault of Secrets. This is a small area with a few enemies and a bunch of locked doors that contain secrets that don't open. There is a scroll door, however. It says, you are the boss of your life. The correct scroll is Romans 10, verse 9, which says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This verse is one of the foundational verses of the Christian faith. Romans is a book attributed to the Apostle Paul. Paul previously went under the name Saul and persecuted and killed Christians until God confronted him on the road to Damascus. After Saul became Paul, he wrote a series of letters to the early Christian churches that make up for the bulk of the New Testament. Though there is some debate as to whether some of the letters were written by Paul or a pseudepigraphic, meaning someone else wrote as Paul, generally 13 to 14 books of the New Testament were written by Paul. The verse used to open the scroll door might sound simple, and to some degree it is, but it requires a heart change that sometimes gets overlooked. One criticism I often hear of Christianity is of people who go on sinning because, oh, I can be forgiven. The belief in Christ necessitates a death to the self to live for God. This means the refutation of sinful practices. Does it mean a Christian will be perfect? Definitely not. It means we now no longer will be condemned for our sin because Christ already suffered the price. However, when we go on and continue to sin without a care, we live under what writer Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. Cheap grace is not a saving grace because it rejects the price that was paid for our sins. Only costly grace is the saving grace because it is a grace that changes the heart. When we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we know to turn away from what is wrong. When we don't listen to that conviction, we are living as we were before we were saved and spit upon the sacrifice that was given for our lives. It is a sign of disrespect toward God as it does not value his sacrifice. One thing I think the developers did well in the final level is confront some of the more fundamental issues in the Christian faith. Rather than just dealing with problems of sin, worldly wisdom tries to refute the core principles of the Christian faith. As we open the door, we find a wooden cross. We can now leave this area and navigate two doors to the right to enter the halls of faith using the key of faith. <sighs> We're almost there. There are a bunch of rooms with power-ups and enemies. One door leads to a large chasm. Your character says, Wow, that is too far. I can't make that jump. I must try to find another way. However, we must have faith. In a move that I feel is inspired by Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade, you must jump and you will find yourself thrown to the other side of the chasm in front of the scroll door. The scroll door says, there is nothing to look forward to. While not phrased in exactly the same way, this thought lines up very much with nihilist philosophy. Nihilism is the belief that there is no inherent meaning to life. The refutation is 2 Peter 3.13, which says, But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. This nets you the key of love. Philosophical views can be difficult to confront because they are often held at the core of who someone is. Though most people evolve their ideas about the world over time, it is rare that we radically shift our philosophies. There is no way to prove one religion over another, just as there is no way to prove nihilism over existentialism or vice versa. Your view of the world is largely how you choose to interpret it. For me, the world has only made sense from a Christian point of view. I can't completely explain why I believe what I do, because that would require a complete account of my experiences as a human, many of which I don't even remember, even though they shaped who I am. For me, there is too much order in nature for it to be random. I see the complexity of something like an eyeball or the brain and how so many systems have to align in perfect order for them to function, and I can't believe that it simply just came to be through random chance. I don't have the answers to all the world's questions, and Christianity will not give you the specific answers to all the mysteries of the world. What Christianity promises is the hope that comes through following God. I figured that even if I went my own way to try and find out answers to my questions, I wouldn't be able to find the answers anyway, since they are inherently unknowable. There is no definite answer for what the meaning of life is. Is it to learn? Is it to love? Is it to have kids? Is it all of them? I will never know. I don't think I will ever stop asking these questions because I love learning and thinking about big topics, but I am content in the fact that after I die, I'll either experience nothingness if God does not exist, or I'll find out that there is another kind of existence. 
What that existence is, I don't know. Christianity promises heaven. That brings a lot of preconceptions on our part, mainly due to what we see in the media, but I have to imagine that heaven will be unlike anything we could possibly imagine. Anyway, now that we have the key, we are only a few rooms away from the end. Head into the halls of obedience. There are tons of enemies here. Lots of self-glorification and arrogance. In fact, there's another room filled with arrogance heads. In this room, we have the final door. Use the key of love and enter the innermost regions of your heart. This area is vaguely designed like the tabernacle that the Israelites erected during their nomadic period in the desert, however the design doesn't quite match it. Finally, we make it to the final room. There is a throne with your character sitting upon it. Blast him and place the cross. Christ is now the ruler of your heart. Whew. This essay slash walkthrough slash rambling has taken me about a year to write. As of now, it is over 23,000 words, which is about half the length of the books I've written. Saints of Virtue is an undoubtedly weird game. Even when looked at with the most favorable lens, the game itself has a lot of issues. It definitely is not a great tool for evangelism, as there's not much of a coherent message the game is trying to convey. The visual style of the game is all over the place, the combat is one note, there are multiple game-breaking bugs, and the puzzle mechanics can be obtuse or fiddly to get to work. However, I still come back to this game over 20 years later after first playing it. It was one of the first, if not the first, video game I ever played. I used to only be able to play the Caves of Loneliness and the Mall of Distractions because I was too scared of the other areas. What the game lacks in visual coherence, it makes up for in how interesting it looks. With the rise of liminal spaces, this game could easily sit with well-known games in the genre like LSD Dream Simulator, the various backroom games, or the countless PS1-style horror games on itch.io. The game is interesting to look at. I feel like the first level is where most of the attention went. There seems to be more going on with them visually and thematically. The labyrinths of legalism are more annoying than anything else, and outside of the trap room, aren't that interesting. New Age Nirvana is a bit of a step up with some of the better music of the game and interesting visuals. The Domain of the Heart honestly pisses me off more than anything. There isn't much variance with essentially only a rocky swamp area, the Ruins of Pride, and the Temple of the Heart. The music sucks severely here. This level is also most affected by the bugs of the game which really sucks. I remember the disappointment I had as a kid after finally making it to this area, only to realize that I couldn't beat it because the Poison Swamp killed me, even with the power up. Still, I find enjoyment out of playing the game. Part of it is nostalgia. But any kind of game that explores philosophy and religion interests me. The developer team of this game was very small, and I can't imagine they had a large budget. For what the game is, it isn't that bad. Using the Saints X patch really helps with the outdated controls and the bugs. I recall seeing the developers of Saints of Virtues wanting to make a sequel, but if they did, I haven't found it. According to Wikipedia, one of the developers, Michael Ulrich, now works for 2K Sports on the art team. I don't know what happened to the people in Shine Studios, but I hope they have had a good life. You never really know how your work affects people. You might make something that does not have much of a legacy. However, there might be a few people who engage with it, and it becomes an important part of their life. I don't imagine the developers of this game ever thought some nerd would be writing a novella-length essay on their video game, or that it would have been an important step in a person's video game experiences, but it certainly has stayed with me. There is very little information about this game online. There is one other complete playthrough on YouTube than mine, and a few people who have played a few minutes of the game. There are a couple of videos that bash the game. Saints of Virtue is mostly a forgotten game that a couple of people remember as that weird Christian game. I laugh when I search for the game on YouTube and see my own videos as the top search results. For a game that means so much to me, I'm happy that I've been able to do my own little part in preserving it, at least in video form. Throughout this video, I have mentioned the project Saints X several times. This patch makes the game much more playable. I'll link to it in the description. Thanks again to Idler and Isaiah Kelly. The Saints X website has a museum section that links to a lot of promotional material for the game, as well as archives of the Shine Studios website and other interesting assets. If you're interested, I have a full video walkthrough on my channel using the original game that I modified to run in DOS. I also have a video on how to get it running in DOS and a video on how to get the assets for the game if you are interested in a particular sound or texture. The soundtrack and many of the sound effects are on YouTube by Servant of the King. All these people will be linked in the description along with other links to interesting Saints of Virtue material. As to what I'll do next, I feel as if I have accomplished what I set out to do with Saints of Virtue. I don't have anything planned, but I upload videos of mostly my dogs, things I find interesting or want to preserve, and things that are meaningful to me. 
I might mess around and try my hand at making some vaporwave versions of the music in Saints of Virtue, but seeing as I possess no musical talent, that may or may not come to pass. I may look into doing a video on the Carnivore's Dinosaur Hunter games, since those were another big part of my childhood, and I've only recently discovered the games are still alive due to the modding community. Anyway, this project has been the biggest project I've done outside of my books. I enjoyed the trip down memory lane. The future is written in clay, so who knows what will become of Saints of Virtues. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.